About a decade ago, in my mid-30s, I worked as a security guard at a cemetery located in a less than desirable part of the city. The need for round-the-clock security was paramount, even though we still had individuals attempting to sneak in at various hours to vandalize tombstones or, shockingly, try to exhume graves. Most of these antics unfolded under the cover of night, which suited me just fine as I primarily worked the evening shift, usually from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Admittedly, I still had to be alone on the premises for a couple of hours, between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., but it was far preferable to the dreaded graveyard shift. On one fateful day, I received a warning about some suspicious individuals randomly frequenting the cemetery at odd hours, effectively stalking the place. This unsettling activity had persisted for several days, and my co-workers and I were clueless about their identities or intentions. I agreed to keep a vigilant eye out. By six o'clock, my fellow workers had departed, leaving me to patrol the cemetery on my own. This was always the most enjoyable part of my shift, as I didn't have to pretend to be busy when others were around. Frankly, there wasn't much purpose to my presence when my colleagues were present either. You see, the job mainly involved cruising around in a golf cart, ensuring nothing untoward was happening. Between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m., I conducted my rounds, picking up the occasional piece of litter strewn across the grounds. A few more visitors came and went, and at 8.30 p.m., I waited for the last of them to exit before locking up the front gate. As I secured the gate with a chain and padlock, I spotted a group of individuals on the other side of the road, all facing in my direction as though observing my actions. With the gate safely locked, I returned to my cart and drove off, well aware that this group might be the ones I was supposed to be on the lookout for. There were three of them, from what I could discern, and they lingered in the same spot for a few minutes before eventually walking away. I conducted another sweep, ensuring they weren't attempting to infiltrate from the sides. But I found no trace of them. At around nine o'clock, I parked near the front gate once more for a brief respite. Suddenly, a sharp, echoing sound pierced the quiet night. I spun around to locate the source, but the darkness obscured my vision. Firing up the cart, I ventured into the field, attempting to pinpoint the noise. As I drew closer, I discerned two figures ahead, not the three I had seen earlier. They noticed my approach, turning to face me but making no attempt to flee. I halted the cart about 15 feet away and stepped out. The cemetery closes at 8.30. You need to leave. I called out, my tone growing more impatient and slightly anxious. Do I really need to call the police? I added, my nerves escalating. That's when I noticed that one of them was holding a shovel, although they weren't standing near any graves. My gaze shifted to the ground beside them, revealing a freshly dug hole. Out of nowhere, a voice behind me startled me. Yo, the two individuals sprinted away, and the one behind me veered in a different direction. I jumped back into the cart, ready to give chase, but it immediately became evident that something was wrong. The cart shook and wobbled, rendering it undrivable. I hopped out and discovered that both left tires had been slashed. Panicking, I dialed the police and rushed to the main building. Fortunately, the group didn't pursue me, but given their likely involvement in sabotaging the cart and their number, I was overcome with fear. When the police arrived, the group had vanished into thin air. However, we stumbled upon a partially dug hole and were left baffled until we found something else along the fence not far from the excavation site, a body bag. Tragically, it contained a deceased individual. In the days that followed, it emerged that the man inside the bag was associated with a gang and had likely met his demise in a shooting. Our theory was that the group had sought to discreetly dispose of the body, believing that burying it in the cemetery would help it blend in and go unnoticed. While it wasn't the worst plan, their execution left much to be desired. Regrettably, none of the individuals in the group were ever located or identified. I was employed at a cemetery situated on the outskirts of my town, 
a rather compact burial ground spanning only a few acres. My tenure there had already stretched to a year, and I couldn't help but loathe every minute of it, not particularly due to its eerie cemetery setting, but mainly because it was dreadfully monotonous. The nightly hours were spent in solitude within a small, dimly lit room. Two cameras were strategically positioned on either side of the cemetery, with an additional one mounted at the entrance of the diminutive structure I occupied. My boss's mantra was simple, my sole responsibility was to be present, and if anything untoward occurred, my duty was to promptly summon the police to handle it. In the entire year leading up to the incident I'm about to recount, not a single noteworthy event had unfolded. Given the cemetery's modest size and the tranquil nature of our small town, excitement was a rare commodity. One Monday evening, I drove into the parking lot to commence my night shift, relieving my coworker from his day shift. I hadn't managed to catch much sleep earlier in the day, so I brought along a cup of coffee to stave off drowsiness during the initial hours of my shift. I sipped on my coffee while attentively monitoring the surveillance cameras and occasionally scrolling through my phone. However, as the clock struck 1 a.m., my weariness began to overpower me. I found myself nodding off in my chair, and the coffee offered little resistance to my drowsiness. Somewhere in the middle of that hour, I must have slipped into a deep slumber because I was startled awake by an unfamiliar noise, metal creaking behind me. Swiftly swiveling around in my chair, I noticed that the door to my building had been left slightly ajar, swaying gently in the breeze outside. My heart pounded with fear. I rose from my seat, cautiously pushed the door open further, and peered outside. To my relief, there was no one in sight. I forcefully shut the door, double-checking that it was securely locked. It could have been a simple oversight in closing the door, but my hair stood on end. I decided to review the footage from the camera positioned outside the building, but it revealed no one approaching the structure. Now thoroughly awake and on edge, I diligently monitored every camera. Approximately 10 minutes later, I spotted movement on one of the screens. The camera at the far end of the cemetery captured the silhouette of a person strolling through the graveyard. I watched with bated breath as they slowly made their way among the gravestones, coming to a halt. After a few tense seconds, I picked up the phone and dialed 9 to 1 1 while keeping my eyes locked on the screen. I whispered to the operator, explaining that I worked at the cemetery and there was an intruder. Just as the operator began to respond, the individual suddenly sprinted across the yard, disappearing from view. An involuntary gasp escaped my lips as I frantically scanned the other cameras for any sign of him. Moments later, he reappeared on a different screen, racing past it. Finally, he emerged on the camera overlooking the exterior of my building. I relayed the situation to the operator in hushed tones, stressing the need for silence. I gently placed the phone down and fixated on the camera feed. The man stood right outside my door, his gaze locked onto the camera. A shiver ran down my spine as it seemed as though he could peer through the screen into my very soul. Hello, Ken. Can you help me? His muffled voice emanated from the other side of the door. Without waiting for a response, he circled around to the back of the building, where there were no cameras. I could hear his footsteps brushing against the wall as he approached. Abruptly, his footsteps receded, and he vanished from my auditory range. My heart raced until the police arrived. I half expected to sound delusional when I recounted the bizarre events, but the authorities discovered distinct shoe prints in the grass. They followed the prints some distance beyond the cemetery's boundary, but ultimately lost the trail. The man's peculiar behavior and cryptic plea for help left me deeply unsettled. Though I continued working at the cemetery despite the terror that had unfolded, nothing else transpired, and the man never returned. Nevertheless, I knew I would never dare to fall asleep at that cemetery again. My friends and I weren't exactly known for our intelligence. We often engaged in reckless activities like exploring abandoned areas and vacant houses. However, the most foolish thing we ever did was venture into a cemetery one fateful night during our sophomore year of high school. 
It happened on a Friday evening, our usual hangout time. Typically, we didn't have any concrete plans. We simply decided on activities as the night progressed. By midnight, two of our tired friends had left, leaving only me and my buddy Dan. Neither of us was particularly tired, and the prospect of spending the night at home bored didn't appeal to us. Dan suggested we check out the cemetery near his house, thinking it might be a spooky and exciting adventure. I agreed, not giving it much thought at the time. Sure, it sounded a bit eerie, but it was just an ordinary cemetery, or so I assumed. We hopped into Dan's car and drove to his house, where we parked and walked to the nearby cemetery gate. The entrance was grand, but the perimeter was enclosed by a short wooden fence, which we easily climbed over. As soon as we stepped inside, adrenaline surged through us. The cemetery was undeniably creepy, with minimal lighting provided by a few dim standing lamps scattered around. We didn't have a clear objective, but I believe we simply wanted to traverse the place without succumbing to fear and then leave. We must have passed about 10 or 15 gravestones when Dan abruptly halted, his gaze fixed ahead. He signaled for me to wait, and although I couldn't see much, I could make out a figure standing beside one of the gravestones in the distance. Drawing closer, both Dan and I were uncertain about what to do, frozen in place. We assumed we had been caught by one of the cemetery caretakers and feared possible consequences, like getting arrested or worse. The man, still a few feet away, finally spoke. What are you two doing here? Dan nervously explained that we were simply exploring. The man decided to escort us out, and as we followed him back in the direction he came from, regret began to set in. We both wished we had run away when we first spotted him. Walking behind him, we passed beneath one of the standing lamps, and Dan and I simultaneously froze. The man was dressed in tattered clothes, nothing like what a cemetery keeper would wear. This guy looked homeless, and there was something unsettling about his appearance. He must have heard us stop because he turned around, and the look on his face revealed that this man was unhinged. Come here, he said angrily, taking a step toward us. Without a second thought, Dan and I bolted in opposite directions. The man's footsteps behind me felt dangerously close, as if he might tackle me at any moment. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, and we managed to leap over the fence. On the other side, we heard the man stop, and then pound the wooden fence in frustration. We rushed home, vowing not to share our experience with anyone except our friends, because we knew we had been engaging in illegal activities. Both of us believed that the man was likely a homeless individual attempting to rob us, or potentially something even more sinister. Fortunately, we never made the mistake of returning to that place again.